and, and the thoughtfulness of all Georgians that you've um, put into this and the many, many hours upon hours upon days of hard work. Mr. Chairman, we know that you care about us, you care about Georgians, and we appreciate your work on this, and uh, that's all the questions we have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and once again, I want to thank our staff. I want to thank our committee and committee members. I want to thank those of you that, that, that aren't necessarily on appropriations but do come to us from time to time with suggestions. Uh, we do take those suggestions serious. We do look at those suggestions and, and, and uh, seek input and just thank you so much for allowing us to do the job that we do. And thank you for your willingness to serve in this body, but thank you more than that for the job that you do for 10.7 million Georgians across this state. Thank you, I yield the well. Chairman England, I see your light is on, so you would now be recognized for a motion. Well, Mr. Chairman, you know, I don't guess I talked enough here uh, while I was up there. Well, but I don't I know would, about that, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, <laughs> Mr. Chair, I move that House Bill 31 do pass by committee substitute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize Chairman Powell for a second. I second the motion. Thank you, Representative Powell. Representative Powell seconds the motion. At this time, we'll call the question on House Bill 31. All in favor will say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and House Bill 31 passes by committee substitute. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from the 116th House District, Chairman England. Ms. Chairman, as Chairman of the Committee of the Whole House, you are instructed to report, to the, uh, report the action of the Committee of the Whole House to the House. The chair recognizes Majority Leader Burns. Mr. Speaker, the committee of the whole House has had under consideration House Bill 31 and has instructed me as its chairman to report the same back to the House with the recommendation that House 31 do pass by committee substitute. The report of the chairman of the committee of the whole House is received. The Committee of the Whole House has had under consideration House Bill 31 and has reported the same back to the House with a recommendation that House Bill 31 do pass by committee substitute. The Committee of the Whole House is hereby dissolved. We do have some members that wish to be heard on the bill. The chair recognizes Representative Dreyer to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to begin just, by just saying a moment, that just a moment, gentlemen. House will be in order. The gentleman is entitled to the respect of the members while he is in the well as any member. The gentleman may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I begin, I want to say I have a great deal of respect for everyone that was involved in this process, and in particular, I have respect 
for the intentions of the individuals that work so hard for this budget and their intentions to stand up and protect the most vulnerable Georgians. But I believe we are making a fundamentally flawed policy decision in this budget. I rise today in support of providing life-saving access to health care for working families across Georgia. I rise in support of bridging the Medicaid gap and against HB 31. Georgia's health care system is failing many Georgians. We have the fourth highest uninsured rate, including over 500,000 people that could be covered if we just invested $143 million a year, which would allow us to draw down $1 billion in federal funding. We can talk about the nine to one return on investment because the federal government pays 90% of it, but let's talk about the 56,000 jobs that this would create all over Georgia. Good paying jobs that generate taxes. That is twice the number of jobs as Amazon would bring and it would be spread throughout our entire state. This is the number one economic development appropriation that we could do. But the real kicker is we're not only creating jobs and stimulating the economy, but we're also helping save lives, including in each of our districts. When we look at the waiver program in SP 106, it only helps people up to 100% of the federal poverty level. We don't know if the federal government will reimburse 90% of that. In fact, the federal government has never reimbursed up to 900% when a state has only covered people up to 100% of the federal poverty level. We could easily end up paying as much or more if we don't bridge the Medicaid gap fully. But let's talk about people, which is why we're here. Families making between 25,000 and 35,000 fall in this gap of 100 to 138 percent of the federal poverty level. These are hardworking Georgians, and each of us has 1,400 people on average just like this in our district. And including 14 counties that have struggling hospitals, there are 50,000 people. We could talk about people like Matt Hillman, who is 29 and a GSU grad, and a couple years ago, had his first onset of bipolar disorder and lost his job. And now he has no health insurance and he is not covered because we have not bridged the Medicaid gap. We could talk about a family in Habersham County that has an adult son with a congenital heart defect that has no insurance and can't monitor his blood pressure sufficiently. Or the 19 year old with autism who has to pay $400 a month for her medicines, which will run out for funding when she turns 21 and she is off of the Medicaid program. What does this have to do with the budget today? If we were to insert, and we still have time left, we have a process in the Senate, we'll have a conference committee. If we were to put $143 million for Medicaid expansion in the budget before we leave this session, we could have 500,000 more people with health care coverage on July 1 of this year. We would be saving lives. My job is to fight for people in my district and throughout Georgia, but all we need is the political will. We had the political will to find $150 million for new voting machines. We had the political will to enact a rural hospital tax credit, which cost us, if the changes go through this year, up to $100 million a year. We reformed ad valorem taxes because we had the political will and that cost our state over $182 million a year. And if we're talking about reducing the income tax by another 0.25%, that's $450 million a year, which is three times what it would cost to bridge the Medicaid gap, bring 56,000 jobs to our state, and save lives. Last year, after the budget left this chamber, when it came back, we found the political will to add 140 million additional dollars to QBE. But the 500,000 people we're talking about aren't just numbers, right? Their moms, their dads, their brothers, their sisters, their friends, their cousins, and they don't have access to life-saving care, including preventative care. They're managing diabetes through emergency room visits, which we're all paying for. We could save lives, we could do good, and we can make a tremendous difference for these people, including the 1,400 in my district,
that urgently need this access. So I, I appreciate and respect the process and the good intentions and the hard work, but I will vote no, and I urge us to find a way over the next two weeks, find the political will to find a $143 million investment to draw down a billion dollars, stimulate rural economy and save lives. I will yield for questions. You have some questions. Okay, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Chairman Setzler to your right for a question. Does gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Appreciate your passionate um, appeal for, for health care for people in need. Isn't it true, though, that this state is very generous to health care for our children? That, that uh, you, know, you talk about wanting to raise and expand Medicaid from 100% to 138% of the federal poverty line. But isn't it true that we cover children through the Peach Care for Kids program? Not to 138%, but 235% of the federal poverty line in this budget. Uh, yes, sir, which is a great program. So, so do you have concerns that, that voting against the Peach Care program this budget that covers kids up to 235% of the federal poverty line, is that not something that's worthy of your support in voting for the budget? It's certainly worthy of my support. And there are many, many good items in this budget. And I am voting against a budget that, that misses one of the most important and impactful policy decisions that would have a nine to one return on federal dollars and would stimulate the economy. So when we're missing probably the biggest addition, I can't support the budget at this time. Isn't it true, uh, just a gentleman further yield. Yes. Isn't it true that in this budget that uh, well above the 100% FPL line, that up to 211% of federal poverty line, this budget through our, our Healthy Babies program covers expecting mothers prenatal care and birthing services for their children up to 211% of the federal poverty line in this budget for adults, not just for children, but for adults. For adults with children, right? No, no, for, for expecting, mothers expecting mothers and their, their prenatal care and delivering their children. It cover this, this budget covers them up to 211%, not yes. 138, but 211. Yes, sir. And does the gentleman yield for one further question? I, I do. As we talked about earlier in this budget, doesn't it include $600 million of new, of new money for public education, an 8.1% increase in funding for teacher base pay, and over 300 positions for our medical schools to expand access to care to underserved areas around the state? It does, which is very worthwhile. So for those points alone, would, would, doesn't this budget um, deserve our support? And perhaps if you have other policy concerns, you could address that at a future day. But I think this budget is worthy of our support. I would just ask you, based on your concurrence, to, to join me. I, I definitely respect the Chair Setzler's position on this. But when we're talking about kids and expectant mothers, I think we have a concern with our older brothers and sisters. I think we have a concern with their fathers. I think we have a concern with their mothers that aren't expecting. And if we're going to keep families together and healthy, we need to expand Medicaid. I will yield for more questions. Chair recognizes Chairman Beverly to your left for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does the gentleman yield? I do. Is it not true that on January 18th, 2019, the Department of Audits and Accounts gave a fiscal note uh, based on data from DCH, the Federal Exchange, and population projections from the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget that it would cost approximately $150 million to expand Medicaid. That's exactly right. Is it further not, does the gentleman further yield? Yes, sir. Is it not further true that the Georgia uh, Budget and Policy Institute anticipates right now by not expanding Medicaid that 27,000 veterans fall into the coverage gap and they're not being covered right now? And that's exactly right. And on your earlier point, uh, Mr. Chair, my chair, the, um, the $150 million does not take into account the 56,000 jobs which will generate income tax and sales tax revenue. So it could be potentially neutral for the state at the end of the day once this goes on for two or three years. Thank you for your question. Do you further yield? I do, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Chairman Petrie to your left for a question. Uh, does, does the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, and uh, as Representative Sessler, Sessler said, thank you for your passion. Um, is it not true, just commonsensically, that if we create a federal bias to serve able-bodied working people, that that necessarily 
could harm efforts to serve society's most vulnerable on Medicaid? Uh, Representative, we are adding to the protections of access to health care. So I guess I would say in the one of the greatest countries in the history of the world, the greatest country I think in the history of the world, that we can provide access to hospitals and doctors for everyone. And what's so compelling to me about this 100 to 138% of the federal poverty level is these are working families making between 25 and $35,000 a year. So I don't see any way we should penalize those type of people and those type of efforts and bar the hospital door to them. Mr. Speaker, I could yield for one more. Chair recognizes Representative Lott to your right for a question. Thank you, sir. Do you yield? I do. Um, would you agree that this body should seek to bridge what is considerably called the gap? Uh, yes. So the gap is those within this state that make less than 100% of the FPL, the federal poverty level. And those that make above 100% of the federal poverty level are offered insurance. And so I, just for clarification, you do agree that it is the gap that we're seeking to cover? I'm, I'm talking, when I'm referring to the gap, um, and I've used numbers from a think tank, I, I, I refer to it as folks between zero and 138% of the federal poverty level. And, I, and I, I'm talking about families that may be between 100 and 138% that don't have access to health care. So, follow, do you yield for a follow-up? Yes, certainly. So, the Affordable Care Act exchange plan offers insurance for those making above 100% of the federal poverty line. So my question to you is, what is the gap? So the gap would be individuals that are making between 25 and 35,000 and below that I'm talking about, but individuals that are making 25 to 35,000 a year cannot afford $1,000 a month for health insurance when actually the Affordable Care Act provides for full coverage for those individuals. Follow-up? Yes. So those making above 100% of the federal poverty line, as written in the Affordable Care Act, are required a no, no greater payment than 2% of their, their income. And for an individual, that would be $24 a month. So from 100 to 138, and of course, that rate changes as you go up into 400% of the federal poverty line. And I just want to be clear that we are agreeing on this. But you do understand, sir, that the gap are those patients in Georgia and those um, citizens that are below 100% of the federal poverty line. Um, to the to the governor's floor leader, I, I I've seen and known of individuals that are that are not offered insurance at 24 a month that they can pay for it. And and what I understand is there are 500,000 people, and I've seen white papers on this that are not insured in Georgia but would be insured in Georgia if we went to 138 percent of the federal poverty level and specifically that's an additional 240,000 people that are between 100 percent and 138 percent of the federal poverty level. Thank you for your answer. One, one sure. more follow-up to you. So I, my, my question for you is do you sir understand that there may be those in Georgia without insurance that are above 100% of the federal poverty level, but it is not because it is not afforded to them through the Affordable Care Act exchange and or commercial plans beyond, uh, beyond their ability. I would be happy to, to talk further about this, but, but what the Affordable Care Act offers, and it's very clear, is that when, you, when we expand Medicaid to 138 percent of the federal poverty level, they will they are required to certainly in the next year pay 90 percent of the health care cost. And so what's what's very fascinating about that is if we're doing a waiver. We don't know exactly what they'll pay. And we have to ask the federal government to waive the rules and make an exception because the rule provides expanding to 138 percent. We get a 90 percent reimbursement. So what it would do if we if we don't go to 138 percent, 
we would be uncertain on what the federal government would do. We would have to ask for them to, to give us a waiver. We don't know when that would come in, so we're looking at July 2020, the earliest, that um, additional health care access could be provided. Uh, thank you for answering. Thank, thank you. you. I yield the well. Gentleman has yielded the well. Chair recognizes Representative McLeod to speak to the bill. Thank you, Speaker Austin. Uh, thank you to the Chairman England for all you guys' hard work and to the team that put this together. Big ups to my colleagues. Okay, first of all, it's cold in here. I'm hoping I can uh, muster this up, but um, um, it is my understanding that um, when we talk about a budget, it's a representation of our values and what we care about and what our priorities are. And I believe this budget fall short. Candidate Kemp said, proposed that he was going to give teachers a $5,000 raise. Governor Kemp said he's going to give teachers a $3,000 raise. Today in the budget, it's $2,775. It seems to me that teachers are being used as ping pongs. Teachers are responsible for almost every one of us that's sitting in here, and they need to be valued. I do not believe that we are valuing them the way they need to be valued. Yes, it's exciting to know that they're going to get an increase, but we're not, we're not giving them that ex increase out of really a priority. We're doing it because, I think, for political reasons. I don't think this is based really on really making sure that teachers are being treated like they should be. There's no cost of living in for the teachers. The teacher's retirement has not been addressed. The budget cuts dual enrollment. The budget does not expand Medicaid so, so that more people can have access to health care. The voting machines in the budget will not provide the confidence to our voters or allow it to be audited Gwinnett County is still seeing a budget shortfall. There's nothing in there for cafeteria workers or janitors, et cetera. A vote for this budget as is, is not for me. I hope that when this budget goes over to the Senate, they will make some of the necessary changes that is required. I will let you know, and I will repeat, this money is not free stuff, it's not free money, this is taxpayer dollars, and we're here to manage taxpayer dollars and give them back something for their investment. I yield the well. Chair recognizes Representative Wynn to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, I want to acknowledge and commend the work that has been put into this budget from members on both sides of the aisle, and I'd like to thank Chairman England and all those involved in this process. There are a lot of really good things in this budget, including fully funding QBE and the much-deserved pay raises for our hardworking teachers, our personnel, and our state workers. So I want to be clear, I'm not here to oppose any of those things. But I am here to call into question the $150 million line item we've allotted to voting machines. And earlier this week, we heard the debates on House Bill 316, so I don't want to rehash all the points that brought us to nearly a straight party line vote on this issue. I'm here, like the rest of us in this body, to do the jobs that my constituents elected me to do. And the voters in my district have overwhelmingly expressed to me that they don't support $150 million we're allocating for these machines. And neither do some voters across the state of our Georgia, which 55% of voters have already expressed 
that they support hand-marked paper ballots over electronic voting machines. And these are not all Democratic voters. Yesterday, Freedom Works and the National Election Defense Coalition issued a letter in opposition of House Bill 316. And in this letter, these organizations brought attention to the fiscal implications. Our budget reflects $150 million as an initial investment, but it does not include any estimates on what it would cost to run elections over time. And I'd like to read for, to you directly from this letter. Purchasing and requiring all voters to use electric, electronic BMDs will be a needless waste of taxpayer dollars and will provide an inferior voting experience for Georgia citizens. We would be happy to work with the committee on a path for Georgia to move to paper ballots without wasting over $100 million of taxpayer money on unnecessary equipment that benefits voting system vendors, not the voters of Georgia. And in fact, we are paying for these voting machines through 20-year bonds, which incurs an additional $13 million in interest payments from our general fund this year. That $13 million can be freed up for other priorities that would help hardworking Georgians. What if instead we put $5 million towards the child and parent services programs to subsidize low-income child care? That would fund 1,000 new slots and allow more working mothers and families to enter into the workforce. What if instead we allotted additional funding to replace our aging school buses? That would help replace the 3,638 older buses we've put on the road that are more likely to break down and lack advanced safety features. That means we would be putting our children in the safest mode of transportation possible. And so when my three-year-old nephew goes to school next year, I won't have to worry about him being transported in a dangerous bus. And what if we instead allotted the funding to support the cost of a full Medicaid expansion so that 38,554 people in my county, DeKalb County, would have access to affordable health care? There are a lot of really good things in this budget, but the budget is also missing the voices of my voters and the voices of voters across Georgia. And they've told us two things. One, they don't want to spend $150 million of borrowed money on voting machines. And two, they want us to invest in a full Medicaid expansion so that half a million Georgians can have access to affordable health care. That's why I cannot, at this time, in good conscience, vote in favor of this budget. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield for questions. You have no questions. Thank you. What purpose does Representative Gravely rise? Parliamentary inquiry, please. Take your inquiry. Is it not true that this budget contains 259 brand new school buses? If the gentleman so states. What purpose does Chairman Knight rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Isn't it true, Mr. Speaker, that prior year budgets also contain large, large amounts of bonds for the purchase of new buses all across the state? Uh, the, the chair remembers that there have been a number of budget years that that has been the case, yes. What purpose does Representative Donahue arise? Mr. Speaker, isn't it true what, my what, wife, your parliamentary, parliamentary State inquiry. your inquiry. Is it not true that my wife, my two daughters, daughter-in-law, son-in-law are coaches, teachers, 
have been in the system for 30 years and under. And if you take zero and you take and add zero to zero and multiply it times zero is zero. So I'm thankful that we have $2,800 for a pay raise for these teachers to work to go full at 5,000. Was there an inquiry in there somewhere? Make sure that you understand. I was very happy for that inquiry if that wasn't true in the budget. Okay. We have had a very thorough discussion. Is there any objection to the previous question on House Bill 31 being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of House Bill 31 will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machines on the passage of House Bill 31. The ayes are 155, the nays are 13. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. The chair wants to announce that House Bill 257 will be carried over to the next legislative day. That's being done at the request of the author who is attending to uh, some more important business today. Um, what purpose does Chairman Elstration rise? Make a motion. State your motion. Mr. Speaker, I move that the rules of the House be temporarily suspended so that two bills may be read for the first time and assigned to committees. Chairman Elstration has moved that the rules of this House be temporarily suspended to allow a bill to be read for the first time and assigned to committee. The clerk will read the caption uh, to both bills. Unnumbered House bill by Representative Elstration to be in Title an Act to amend Article 1 of Chapter 7 of Title 19 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating the general provisions regarding parent and child relationship generally so as to provide for equitable caregivers. Unnumbered House Bill by Representative Fetchstration in the 104th to be entitled an Act to amend Chapter 7 of Title 37 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating the hospitalization and treatment of alcoholics, drug dependent individuals, and drug abusers. On the gentleman's motion that the rules of this House be temporarily suspended to allow two bills to be read for the first time and assigned to committee, is there objection? Is there objection? The chair hears none. It is so ordered they are both assigned to judiciary. What purpose does Chairman McCall rise? Make a motion, Mr. Speaker. State your motion. Move it to rules of the House be temporarily suspended so that uh, a bill can be read for the first time assigned to the committee, please, sir. Chairman McCall has moved that the rules of this House be temporarily suspended to allow a bill to be read for the first time and assigned to committee. Is clerk will read the caption. Unnumbered House bill by Chairman McCall, the 33rd and others to be entitled an act to amend Code Section 4117 of the Fish Code of Georgia and Teddy relating the treatment of agricultural facilities and operations and forest lands as nuisances. On the chairman's motion that the rules of this house be temporarily suspended to allow a bill to be read for the first time and assigned to committee, is there ob objection? 
The chair hears none, and it is so ordered. Agriculture and Consumer Affairs. What purpose does Representative Lott rise? Make a motion, sir. State, state your motion. Ask that the rules of the House be temporarily suspended so that a bill can be read for the first time and assigned to committee. Representative Lott has moved that the rules of this House be temporarily suspended to allow a bill to be read for the first time and assigned to committee. Clerk will read the caption. Unnumbered House Bill by Representative Lott of the 122nd, Lariki of 169th, Ballinger the 23rd, and others be titled an act to amend Chapter 12 of Title 16. The official code of Georgia annotated relating the offense against health and morals so as to provide for the offense of criminal abortion. On the lady's motion that the rules of this house be temporarily suspended to allow a bill to be read for the first time and assigned to committee, is there objection? The chair hears none and it is so ordered. Health and Health and Human Services. If you have signed up for an announcement, the clerk will read the caption to a group of privileged resolutions. Honoring the life and memory of Dr. James Frank. Congratulating Ramsey Furniture Company upon the grand occasion of its 100th anniversary, commending the Miss Georgia Peach Scholarship Pageant and the 2018 Georgia Peach Queens. Commending Amber Patrice Anderson, Adamson Middle School's 2019 Teacher of the Year. And for other purposes, that completes the reading of the privilege resolutions. Is there any objection to the adoption of the privilege resolutions? The chair hears none and the resolutions are adopted. If you have signed up for an announcement, be at the front of the chamber and be ready to go. The House will remain in order until we complete announcements. The quicker we come to order, the sooner we will leave. Chair recognizes Representative Baysmore for she waves. Chair recognizes Chairman Corbett for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Motor Vehicles Committee Full Committee will meet in room 515 upon adjournment of the uh, Judiciary Non-Civil Meeting that is pushed back. So, thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Richard Smith for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Special Committee on Access to Quality Health Care will meet tomorrow morning, um, 8 o'clock, room 341. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Beverly for an announcement. He waves. Chair recognizes Chairman Lumsden for an announcement. The Lumsden Subcommittee of Public Safety and Homeland Security will meet in the morning at 8 o'clock, CLOB 415. We have three bills. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Tanner for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Carpenter Subcommittee of Transportation will meet immediately up on adjournment in CLOB 506, and then the full Transportation Committee will meet uh, directly after that, so 30 minutes after adjournment in CLOB 506. Chair recognizes Chairman Alan Powell for an announcement. Uh, 
the Powell Subcommittee of Public Safety, Homeland Security, that we're going to meet at 2.30 in room 415. We'll still meet, be meeting there, but I'm not sure who's got in front of us. So I'd probably tell you in about 30 minutes maybe to be safe, but come on down there. Tomorrow morning, 8.30, the Regulated Full Ed Regulated Industries Committee will meet in LOB 606 at 8.30. 606 at 8.30. Chair recognizes Chairman Rhodes for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Game Fishing Parks will meet in 403 uh, in the Capitol about 15 or 20 minutes after adjournment. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Cannon for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to bring attention to something on your desks about George's high rate of hysterectomy for fibroids. We have an event happening on Monday morning from 8 a.m. until 10 a.m. Breakfast will be provided and more information will be shared by our guest speakers, Dr. Hawkins and Tanika Gray, who either provide care for fibroids or have had their fibroids removed. We hope to see you here. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Parsons for an announcement. Thank, thank you, Speaker. Energy Utilities and Telecommunications, we're going to meet. Uh, we're going to meet here in a little bit. There's a, somebody in the room before we get there up in 403, but we need to meet because we've got a couple of important bills, Energy Utilities and Telecommunications, including a uh, rural broadband-related bill we need to take up. So if you can just hang on, it's a long day, a lot of people are meeting, but EUT will meet here after, in, a, in a bit, so please hang around, and we plan to meet in 403 upstairs. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Reeves for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Reeves Subcommittee of Judiciary Non-Civil will meet in room 415 of the CLOB immediately upon the adjournment of the Setzler Subcommittee of Judiciary Non-Civil. Chair recognizes Chairman Welch for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Regulated Industry Subcommittee will meet uh, today, today in room 403 of the Capitol. We'll meet immediately on adjournment for about 15 to 20 minutes. Room 403 of the Capitol. Chair recognizes Chairman Setzler for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Setzler Subcommittee of Judiciary Non-Civil will meet immediately upon adjournment in room 415 over in the LOB. Uh, we'll be taking up a Representative Sain's first bill. So come and uh, watch us make a spectacle of the gentleman from the 180th. What time and where? That sounds like fun. Chair recognizes the Majority Caucus Whip, Representative Kelly, for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Kelly Subcommittee of the House Judiciary Committee will meet as soon as I can get down the stairs and into room 132. Look forward to seeing you all there. Chair recognizes Chairman Cooper for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Health and Human Services will not meet today. Health and Human Services will not meet today. We had some time scheduled, but we will meet on Monday at 3 o'clock and at our regular time on Tuesday. Monday at 3 o'clock and 6.06, and on Tuesday at 2 o'clock and 6.06. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes Chairman Corbett for an announcement. The Motor Vehicles Committee will meet upon adjournment. Uh, they've moved their meeting to 4.15, so we have the room upon adjournment, 4.15. The chair recognizes the majority leader of the House for a motion.
chair, <laughs> chair recognizes Chairman Ballinger for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sorry, Majority Leader. Um, your chair, your uh, Juvenile Justice Committee is going to be meeting in 406 over in the CLOB as soon as we have a quorum. So please join us over in 406 in the CLOB. Thank you. Any other announcements? Now, the chair recognizes the majority leader of this house for a motion. One more, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that this house stand adjourned until 9.30 a.m. March 1, 2019. The majority leader has moved that this house adjourn until Friday, March 1, 2019 at 9.30 a.m. All those in favor of the motion will say aye. Those opposed will say no. The ayes have it. And this house will be adjourned until Friday morning, March 1 at 9.30 a.m.